Okay, welcome back everyone. We looked at the life of Stephen and we saw how he was such a great testimony. Uh, he got introduced in Acts chapter 6 and we have already read about his martyrdom in Acts chapter 7. Uh, seems like the Bible presents uh, a very small picture of this man's life, but what an impactful life. Uh, so much for us to learn from him. Uh, a true disciple, we could say, of the Lord Jesus. So let's take time to uh, maybe reflect on what we have learned so far. So if there are any questions, uh, you may go ahead and uh, ask them. We'll talk about all those things and then move on to chapter 8. Um, so uh, I just have a few questions. Um, and one of the first question that I want to ask is in verse 30, we say, uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush. Uh, so uh, it says the angel of the Lord, and then it's actually God who is actually speaking. And uh, we all know that the bush uh, actually represented God. God was speaking. It says, I am the God of Jacob and Abraham. And even in verse uh, 38, I think the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai. So even we know that in Mount Sinai, it's God actually who spoke. So uh, does in the Old Testament, the angel actually signifies God always? Or uh, this is one of the first questions, and then I'll go ahead. Yeah. Nice, Jeffina. That's asked like a theologian. Uh, I'm glad you noticed that portion there where it says angel. So you said verse 31, right? Of Acts uh, 7. Uh, and when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush. So uh, we don't really kind of give a lot of emphasis on that because as you pointed out, we are very clear that it was God who spoke. Uh, and the other other was uh, Jeffina? He was 38. 38. Yeah. Uh, this is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai. So you see the angel, angel, right? If you actually look up that word, uh, angelos is a messenger. So just because it says angel does not mean that it's a heavenly being called as we classify angels. Mm -hmm. It simply means messenger. So God is the one who ministered to Moses that we know. Uh, so we go by the meaning of that word angel. So in English, yes, it seems like it's uh, the created heavenly being, the angels, but that's not the understanding. Message, messenger, angelos in Greek. I hope that clarifies it. So, uh, the other question that I have is uh, yes. it says in verse 38, who received the living or, or I could. So, I believe, I believe it's the Ten Commandments, maybe, but I'm not sure that what this word uh, actually signifies. And I also want to know about verse 43, where it says, I will carry you away beyond Babylon. God's to tabernacle soon. I mean, I just want to know the meaning of the verse of verse 43 and what this living oracle actually is. Yes. Sure, sure, Jafina. So going back to the portion where it says, uh, this is he was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles. Yeah, it oracles that is referring to the Ten Commandments, which were given to uh, Moses uh, to be passed on to the children of Israel. And verse 43, is it? Yeah. Okay, it says, uh, So uh, this particular section, uh, which Stephen spoke, 
is quoted from Amos chapter 5. Okay, so basically he is just uh, quoting what Amos the prophet had already mentioned and uh, Amos actually had said beyond Damascus but for whatever reason Stephen has put the word there beyond Babylon. Okay, now why he, he did that we don't at least I don't know but uh, he is just what Stephen is trying to say is that even though God was so real to the people, they were worshipping you know, other gods and goddesses. So that's why he says tabernacle of Moloch, uh, Remphan, images. And uh, it, it's like saying, you know, God will carry you away beyond Babylon. Is, uh, I don't know, in my view, uh, it's, it's like judgment, isn't it? Like, because you're away from God, that you will experience God's judgment is what uh, Stephen was trying to tell them. So that's the thing. Th does it answer your question or not really? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I just shared some views. Uh, maybe you could look up further. So what was the specific? Oh, I just wanted to know the meaning of it because you know, actually I'm not very sure of the tabernacles and stuff. Uh -huh. still, uh, I still, I'm still studying on it. So I just wanted to know what it actually meant, why he mentioned this over here. And mm -hmm. the reason, as you said, it's right, because they kept worshipping the other gods. Uh, but maybe I'll just look up with you on this. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I okay. hope I'm not taking a lot of... No, it's okay. It's good to look into the details. Oh, yeah, I have three. Sure. Sure. Of course. Okay. Yeah. So uh, in verse 42, uh, you see, uh, they made a verse 41 and 42. It says they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices, rejoiced in the work of hands. So, and then in verse 42, it says, Then God uh, gave them up to the worship, uh, the host of heaven, as it is written. So, uh, the, what this host of heaven actually signifies, uh, they worship the calf. I understand that. Is it, is it course, course that heaven is God. I, I I just don't know. I'm just wondering uh, like what he gave them up on. Okay. Yeah. See, uh, here Stephen is summarizing that they worship everything else other than God. That's his point. So he's not being very specific to a timeline where it's only the worship of a calf because he's also uh, speaking of Moloch, Remphan, these, these are all gods and goddesses of uh, other religions, philosophies, places, communities. So it's not specific to a particular timeline. So in general, he's saying you're worshipping everything other than God. So in that context, when he says you worship the host of heaven, he means that there was also practices where People worship stars, uh, you know, uh, like heavenly bodies, and uh, have, you could also it, uh, infer that as heavenly hosts, like maybe angel worship. So all these false practices were there among the people, which were picked up from other communities. So that was his point. So I, I hope it answers. It's not specific to a timeline. Because if it was only to a timeline, you're right. You know, uh, when Aaron and all were there, only the calf is mentioned. But it's over a long period of time. In general, they are saying that he's saying that your hearts are so far away from God. Okay. Sure. What is the next one? So uh, the next one is, uh, I just want to clarify this. In verse 22, uh, we see Moses was uh, mighty in words and deeds, but we all know what he said in Exodus 4.10, uh, that uh, I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Moses says this with God. So I heard people preaching that even if you're weak, uh, it's fine, God will help you through this. And I, I once... I think it happened in Bible college. Once someone objected, like, no, in uh, Acts 22, it, say, in, uh, 7, 22, it says that he's so mighty in words and deeds. So was Moses mighty in words or no? 
uh, because he himself said, I am slow of speech, slow of tongue, and then God gave error to go with him. So what is your point? Of yeah. Okay. So uh, for this, we must understand the life of Moses. Thankfully, Stephen is narrating it like a story. He said the first 40 years um, uh, of his life, he was in Egypt and he was raised up as a prince of Egypt. So our understanding, when in verse 22, it says, Moses learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. We accept it as it is because he was scholar. He was uh, a learned and a scholarly man. The other people in Egypt would not have had the training uh, and the knowledge which Moses carried. So he was mighty in uh, words and deeds that we know. Okay. Now this was in, uh, in the during the time when he was in Egypt. Now he went to become a deliverer of uh, 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 God's people. He uh, struck the Egyptian and then he fled from Pharaoh. He went into the wilderness. So that is the next 40 years of his life. And towards the end of those 40 years is the burning bush experience. So it is said in this way. Okay, I, I'm just uh, sharing what I have heard and read. Uh, a, a lot of commentators say that uh, in the preparation of Moses, uh, maybe he thought that Initially, he thought that God had chosen the right person. God, thank you for choosing me because I'm so well equipped to be the deliverer. And he went ahead in his own strength to do what God called him to do. But in the next 40 years, God worked on his character. Where he came to a point in the next 40 years where he say, why are you sending me? I'm stammering. I can't even speak properly. So it's like his dependence moved from self uh, or or not even upon God. It was a little unfortunate that he was uh, in this position when the burning bush experience happened, uh, where he was trying to deny uh, the assignment. Okay. Uh, so it's the same person, learned person, but he's been through a journey. And because of that journey, you could say uh, he had a change of mind or he had lost all the confidence which he had in his upbringing, you know, in his uh, qualifications, where he had come to a point where he realized it's going to take more than my qualifications to do what God wants me to do. So some people say, you know, God built his character to eventually depend on God more than himself. So it's the same man. He was mighty in deeds and words, but uh, as he went through the wilderness experience, his heart changed and his mind changed. So, so we have to see this timeline difference. Yeah. Okay. I have one final question. Yeah. Yeah. So in verse 40, in verse 58, we see uh, they cast him out, stoned him, and uh, the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man. Yeah. So, uh, have you, you have any idea on what practice is this? <laughs> like, I feel like it's a cultural practice. Maybe after stoning, they lay down their clothes or something. So, I just want to know, is there any idea, any significance behind it? Okay. Yes. So, uh, yes, Jafina, it seems like there was a certain practice. Once the people were outraged, they cast him out of the city. So, uh, you do read about this casting out of the city, stoning, even in the case of Paul. So, maybe it was their common way of treating uh, betrayers, uh, treating you know, uh, know what term you can use, but uh, anyone who was convicted, right, under the Roman law. Uh, so execution, execution of Stephen happened in the same way as would have happened for any other 
you know, betrayer. And this is a traditional Jewish custom. So you can read it up. There are uh, certain steps to that where they stone the person uh, outside of the city. And uh, yeah, there, there are steps to it. Okay, I'm just looking at one uh, portion here that that is describing the Jewish custom of stoning. Uh, and it says in some writing, Jewish writing called as Mishnah, the stoning has some steps. Like once the trial is finished, a man is convicted, he's brought to be stoned, uh, 10 cubits from the place of stoning, uh, you know, they uh, are, are told to confess their uh, sin. And uh, then they go ahead to strip the person. Uh, and there are other practices such as uh, the witnesses push the criminal from behind. Uh, he falls face downward. So it's a custom of punishment, which I think they followed for uh, Stephen also. They, they tried to follow the same thing. Um, yeah. And... Uh, as far as the clothes is concerned, it doesn't mention here that it is there in the Jewish custom. But uh, my guess is that it could be because remember even Jesus' clothes, it talks about the criminal's clothes. They uh, put lots uh, to, to actually get it. So something with the clothes could be there, some practice with the clothes. In this case, they just brought the clothes and put it at Saul's feet. It's not Stephen's uh, One second, one second. Uh, let's look at it. Yeah, let me just have a look at that. Uh, please tell me the verse there. 58. The cast of what is it? Is it? Uh, their clothes. Okay, fine. Yeah, so my apologies. Uh, I confuse this with the clothes of Jesus, right? So their clothes, it says. Yeah, so then it would be the clothes of the stoners and not of Stephen. So they put down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So yeah, I don't know if that's part of the tradition also. But you're right. It's their clothes. Uh, okay. Could be. <laughs> So yeah, seems like a custom which they practiced. Yeah. Thank sure. you. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything else about uh, Stephen? If others have uh, something to share or talk about. What, what do you like the most about Stephen? Okay, so Jephina is saying boldness. Uh, how about the others? And also, it's not just that he just said the whole story. He literally studied the book of the law and yeah. he has such a good idea, a good view from yeah. the start and the end. True. He didn't miss out of the document. So, well uh, taught, uh, or we could say uh, he had learned the details of the Jewish law and the customs. So, that's true. The scriptures he was quite well aware of. And imagine, I began by saying that the initial years of the church were roughly eight years, isn't it? So, Stephen would have been part of the church for like some six years, seven years, something like that. But in six or seven years to have believers like Stephen in the church who are so strong, so bold, full of, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit and power is amazing. Uh, yeah. Imagine if our churches were filled with such people. Anything else, uh, class? The others? Zeli, any views? Uh, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit is uh, such an uh, inspiring one. 
We are yeah, bad people of the Holy Spirit. True. Thank you. Uh, all right. So let's move on. Uh, the life of Stephen uh, always is, it, it kind of uh, uh, wakes you up, right? Awakens you to live that full, bold life for Christ. Uh, and let's uh, see what else is happening uh, in the book of Acts and who are the other people and what they are doing for the Lord. So now till Acts chapter 8 is uh, the roughly eight years, you know, that, that will uh, uh, be completed. So Acts chapter 8 is another beautiful, beautiful chapter uh, which highlights the life of a person known as Philip. And, you know, we will see all that God did through the life of Philip. Uh, but then the beginning of the chapter uh, is the closing off of, uh, you know, the death of Stephen. So there's a little more that is being spoken about uh, regarding Stephen. And then we go into Philip's life. So let's begin with a Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. Let's read three verses which uh, are connected to chapter 7, and then we can go to the next section. So who would like to read three verses, please? Acts chapter 8, Now Saul was consenting to his death, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen, Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Yeah, thank you, Rosalind. Uh, so it, it says a great persecution arose. But the fact is that we have been seeing persecution. Right from Acts chapter 3, uh, there's something or the other that is happening against uh, the Church of Jerusalem, the leaders. Now we have seen the death of Stephen. One of the church members has been killed. So persecution has been there all along. And it was, it seems great enough. But Luke now describes the season of persecution as great persecution. Meaning more than, more than what we have read till now, there is this whole uh, release of persecution against the people who believed in the Lord. Jesus Christ against the church, it says against the churches who all the believers in the church of Jerusalem. And what happened as a result of this? People were scattered. That is understandable. Maybe they fled for safety to uh, other parts of the Judean region. They fled for safety to outside of the Judean region. Uh, but what did they carry in these? Uh, let's say, you know, seven years of being in the church, hopefully, they were all, most of them were like Stephen, you know, equipped with the word, filled with the Holy Spirit. And being these ready people, they went to other parts of the uh, region. The apostles stayed back, is what we are told. So uh, it also specifies here throughout the region of Judea and Samaria. So that's primarily where the people went. And it also uh, tells us a little bit about the burial of Stephen. So obviously, uh, uh, Stephen was stoned, he died, but the church honored his life uh, by burying him, and uh, they were all broken or grieving uh, because of the death of such a precious person uh, in their lives and they lamented or they grieved over the death of Stephen. There is a mention of Saul here, 
twice if these three uh, verses earlier we saw that people put their clothes at his feet but now twice it says uh, Saul consenting to the death you know leading uh, the team that persecuted Stephen third was Saul he made havoc of the church so we must understand that persecution of the church was a reality but there is a individual an individual who is uh, heading up or who is key to this persecution which would be Saul and so we get this uh, image of the man known as Saul uh, that uh, he was truly uh, you know zealous to defend his faith now why do you think this young man was so zealous uh, you know to uh, go against those who believed in Jesus any idea why Saul could have could have been you know full of fire to kill people drag them out of their homes and do all the things that he was doing <laughs> yeah, maybe you could speak it to the. So I, I remember Paul saying in one verse that for because of Christ, I think nothing is meaningful anymore. There's one verse, and there he says, "I am perfect." Like he was a real Jew, and yeah. how much more he can get it? Maybe uh, one of his thought was he believe so much in this Jewish tradition, he has so much idea about the Jewish tradition, uh, where he might be swimming too much into the tradition, uh, that might have led to this. It's just one of my views. Sure. Yes, thank you, Jafina. So, uh, yes, Paul does talk about himself as somebody who was brought up in the Jewish traditions better than anyone else. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, uh, where, you know, he says he was circumcised on the eighth day. So you see, all the law was followed very correctly uh, in his upbringing. And then he says that uh, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Okay. Uh, and uh, a Pharisee. So his qualifications uh, in the Jewish faith were notable. And so he carried the pride of being uh, a Jew, being a Pharisee. Uh, and when we, we know the perspective that the Jews had about Jesus, that he came to go against the laws of Moses and the, the uh, instructions of worship. So even Paul or Saul at that time, he had the same mindset that Jesus and all his followers were, were uh, a threat to the faith which they had practiced all their lives. And uh, that is why you know, he wanted to go against the believers of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, also, you know, one thing that comes to my mind is that though he was doing all these things, somewhere we can sense that he was true to what he believed, even when he was not a follower of Jesus. Do you see his, his character, his personality? He is so passionate, isn't it? He's so passionate for what he believes that before he comes to know Jesus, he is a persecutor. And what does the passage say? What kind of a persecutor was he? In verse 3, he made havoc of the church, meaning uh, he, he, he created a, a big scene. That means a lot of people were being persecuted and people were scared uh, uh, when they heard the name of Saul. Entering every house, it says, meaning mercy, no mercy. He did not have any compassion for the followers of Jesus. And it also adds there, dragging off men and women. So when Luke writes men and women, uh, the understanding we get is that, you know, okay, dragging men, uh, that may show that the people are brutal. But dragging women 
shows that they were beyond brutal because they had no mercy even for women and that's the kind of uh, uh, anger that Saul carried in his heart for those who were going against uh, the Jew Jewish faith. Now, he was also putting people in the prison. So it gives us a very scary picture of this man called as Saul. And whenever we see somebody who's against God to this extent, our finite thinking says that, uh, oh, <clears throat> God can work in anybody's life but this person, isn't it? That's the way we think, but we will see that something amazing happened in the life of this man called as uh, Saul. So now let's move on. We will read the passage ahead of uh, verse 3. Let's read uh, verses 4 to 8. So whoever is the next person who would like to read can go ahead and do this. Let's be quicker, then we can complete chapter 8. Otherwise, we, we'll have to carry it on to the next session. Therefore, those who were scattered when everywhere preaching the word, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord had heeded the things spoken by Philip, uh, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirit crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Thank you, Zali. Uh, as I shared earlier, we are introduced to a new person in the church. His name is Philip. Have we read Philip's name anywhere else? I'm saying new person because a lot of details uh, we'll understand about Philip's life. But is there a mention of his name anywhere else? Do you remember? Yeah, in chapter 6. That's right. So, uh, the seven men who were chosen, Stephen was, Stephen was one of them, so was Philip. So, we talked about uh, Stephen, a volunteer, and now Philip, a volunteer also. But what is the impact of the life of this man called as Philip? So, there are details about Philip's life in Acts chapter 8. Here, what we are seeing is, Philip went down to the city of Samaria. So he's gone from Jerusalem to Samaria to do what? To preach Christ to the people. That means that he is performing a very evangelistic role to take the gospel to another part of the uh, region. And we notice how when he spoke, lots of people responded so multitudes it says multitudes responded to the preaching of philip and what kind of preaching did he do what kind of ministry did he do very much in line with the kind of ministry that jesus did because along with the preaching were the miracles so uh, verse 6 says people were hearing and seeing the miracles which he did so preaching along with ministering the supernatural power of God. That's how he did ministry. Now, what else happened in his ministry? Uh, unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed. So deliverance, healing, miracles, deliverance. Uh, last portion is again healing. Even the paralyzed and lame were healed is what we see. Now notice in verse 8 it says, there was great joy in the city. Now think about this. One believer goes to another city to uh, preach that Jesus is the Messiah. 
Okay, it's almost like a picture. Maybe the picture we get is uh, how crusades were held, but people will go to a particular place and have a crusade meeting or something, talk about Jesus, and healings take place, deliverances take place. All this happened. So when the gospel is preached, when the power of God is demonstrated powerfully, what happens? Verse 8, there was great joy in that city. So even for us, when we minister the word of God, the gospel of God, right? And the power of God, what happens in the lives of people? This is what is supposed to happen, that there is great joy. Because God's power is intervening in people's lives. They are being set free. They are being restored. They are being called uh, uh, according to the purpose that God has for them. They are being saved. They are being transformed. So overall, in the city, in Samaria, what happened? There was great joy. So as uh, ministers of God, when we go, we step out and we uh, take the gospel out. Let's remember that our ministry can be like the ministry of Philip, so powerful that it actually brings transformation and joy in the city. Now, what were the reactions of the people in the city of Samaria? Let's look at that. Uh, we uh, will specifically look at the reaction of a sorcerer by the name of Simon. So let's read from verse 9 to verse 13, and then we will continue from there. Who would like to uh, read this passage? Yeah, Rosalind, please go ahead. Verse 9, but there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed of the least to the greatest. Uh, okay, Rosalind, sorry to interrupt you. There uh, seems to be some uh, delay, maybe, in hearing your voice. Maybe it's the connection. Uh, so I would need to request another person to read it. Uh, Jeffina, could you please read? Acts chapter 8 verse 9, but there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they gave all heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Okay, so something very, very interesting for us to know. There is a man in Samaria, and uh, what is the description uh, about this man? He was called as the great power of God. And we know uh, that he is a sorcerer. Okay, uh, Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in the city. So he practiced sorcery, and he's called as the great uh, power of God. So which tells us that he must have done some supernatural works. That's why people are uh, looking at him as the great power of God. Now, what is his response to the ministry of Philip? We are told that Philip preached about the kingdom of God. Uh, uh, you know, people believed, people were baptized. Simon also believed. That means that the supernatural through the life of Philip or the ministry of Philip must have been very real. Think about it. Because there is a man who has moved in the occult in a very powerful way. And he is listening or witnessing the ministry of Philip. How can such a man, uh, you know, be amazed to see 
the what is going on unless what is going on is greater than what he has experienced from the spiritual realm so something for us to think about we said that philip is who he's just a volunteer he has come to samaria to preach the gospel but with mighty signs and wonders wow there's a stephen in the church there's a philip in the church what a church isn't it uh, that even a sorcerer is uh, he believed it says verse 13 Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. So the reality of the supernatural in the times uh, of of the early church is something to be noted, because unless the miracles were authentic, the miracles were uh, You know, distinct, or they stood out uh, among the people. A sorcerer will never be amazed, isn't it? Because he is being called as the power of God by the other people. But if Simon the sorcerer is sorcerer is amazed, surely the supernatural would have been demonstrated. Uh, uh, you know, incredibly in the city of Samaria. A lot of people believed they were baptized, so they became. followers of jesus so simon the sorcerer also became a follower of jesus what else is happening uh, in the city of samaria let's read uh, let's go from verse 14 and uh, read till verse 25 uh, i i would request zeli to please go ahead and read is that okay zeli could yes. you now when the apostles yeah. who were at jerusalem heard that samaria had received the word of god they sent peter and john to them who when they had come down to pray for them that they might receive the holy spirit for as yet he had fallen upon none of them they had only been baptized in the name of the lord jesus then they laid hands on them and they received the holy spirit and when simon saw that through the laying of the apostles hands the uh, holy spirit was given he offered them money saying give me this power also that any one on whom i lay hands may receive the holy spirit but peter said to him your money perish with you because you, you thought that the gift of god could be purchased with money you have neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of god repent therefore of this your wickedness and pray god if perhaps uh, uh, perhaps uh, the thought of your heart may be forgiven you for for i see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity then simon answered and said pray to the lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me so when they had testified and preached the word of the lord they returned to jerusalem preaching the gospel in many villages of some uh, of samaritans so thank you so much jazali we get Uh, look at the life of uh, Simon in the in these verses, uh, but also before we we go to Simon's life, uh, look at how the leadership of Jerusalem functions. So there is a new city where people have accepted Christ. Uh, don't you think they should just be happy with that? But they send out Peter and John to do what? To go and minister the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So. the baptism in the holy spirit is a important next step after accepting christ as far as the early church leaders are concerned so this is a pattern everywhere first they'll go preach the gospel people will believe they will repent they will be baptized the next thing is they will be baptized with the holy spirit right they'll be taught about it and they'll be prayed for so that they may receive the baptism with the holy spirit uh and Uh, when uh, peter and john were sent to the samaritans they laid hands on them and the people received the holy spirit now uh, notice simon saw it says it was 18 the laying on of the apostles hands and he offered them money so no, what we must uh, understand here is 
when the apostles laid hands, there was a baptism in the Holy Spirit, but then there could have been some supernatural manifestations, isn't it? That is the reason Simon actually noticed something. And he offered money for that. So our thinking is that by the laying on of hands, there were supernatural manifestations. That's the point. So why should Simon offer money unless something supernatural took place by the laying on of hands? Uh, maybe the gifts of the Holy Spirit were manifested, which he noticed and was amazed by. Uh, and he offers money to the uh, apostles. He says, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So you see, he is making the power of God very transactional. Really? I'll give you this, you give me that. But this comment uh, really upset Peter. And he says, let your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. We can't buy the power of God. We can't buy the work of the Holy Spirit. It is like uh, dishonoring God, isn't it? When we think like this, that we can give something to get uh, what the Holy Spirit is doing. So uh, Peter calls him to repent it and says, you must repent of your wickedness. Perhaps God may forgive you. But also uh, verse 23 is very uh, interesting because we are told that Peter rebukes him and says, you're poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Uh, so it shows us that Simon being a believer, was caught up in the works of the flesh. What is that? Bitterness, iniquity. And uh, Peter, again by the Holy Spirit, remember Peter earlier, Ananias and Sapphira, he could, he could uh, discern that. Now he's discerning about Simon the sorcerer and he's saying, uh, it's not right. The way your heart is, yeah, you may be a believer, but your heart is not right before the Lord. And he actually rebukes him. So, Let's just stop here. We will pray and close, uh, and then you know we will continue on to the remaining of Philip's ministry in the next class. So I just want to request someone to please go ahead and pray. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class that we had. We thank you for the power and the authority that you have given us, Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for baptizing us, filling us with your Holy Spirit. What an amazing time we are living in, Jesus, where we have the revelation of the cross, the revelation of the Holy Spirit. God, I just pray that as we are learning this truth, uh, will the passion for your temple, the passion uh, for your kingdom, the passion passion for us to mightily uh, over the places where the people have lost it will keep growing in our hearts and not only in the book of acts but even us ourselves will move uh, in the mighty uh, presence of god we'll move in the authority of god we'll move in your power and uh, how um, Stephen was defined as a man of full of faith and power, Jesus. Even our life will be defined like that. Our testimony will be like that. Help us to have such boldness and passion and desire for your kingdom. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. And, uh, class, I'm really sorry. I don't know why I always have a cold once I put on these headphones. I don't know if it has to do something. Uh, you know, with the pressure that's causing here, but uh, my apologies for all the sniffles and, you know, uh, the different interruptions, but I hope it won't take away from what we are learning uh, regarding God and his uh, power. So please do pray for me. I really trust that I would, uh, that I will be well from this whole situation in the coming classes. Thank you so much for your patience and uh, adjusting. God bless you all. Uh, let's wrap up for now. And uh, we'll see uh, each other in the next class. God bless you.